This is the second of the quantum formalism differential equations review lectures. Today we'll be discussing existence and uniqueness theorems. So last in the last lecture, some of the big questions we asked are, when do solutions exist and what conditions do we need to ensure that you're, they're unique? And so in this one, we'll be discussing the theorems that give answers to those questions and uh, going over some examples to see how they work out in practice. All right, first we have this theorem for the linear first order case. Uh, and this one really works pretty nicely. So you just need these coefficient functions, p of t and g of t, to be continuous on some interval. Uh, here t0 is the point where we have an initial condition and y0 is the initial y value. So in it, it's in it, we're formulating an initial value problem where y of t0 equals y0 is the initial condition. p of t and g of t are these coefficient functions. And the theorem says that as long as those functions are continuous, then you do have a unique solution and it will be defined on an interval containing t0. And not only that, but it'll be the full interval where you can ensure that the coefficient functions are continuous. So these two intervals are the same. And as we'll see in the nonlinear first order case, that will not happen in the general theorem. Okay, so the proof is more or less, we actually just know how to solve all of these. This is what we spent a lot of time on in the first lecture, using this method of integrating factors. And we saw there was this arbitrary constant C and if you look at it, it's not too difficult to see that you can actually uh, solve any initial value problem. Where do these conditions that P of T and G of T need to be continuous? Well, during this method of integrating factors, we had to take some integrals. To get the integrating factor mu of T, we needed to integrate uh, P of T. And then later to actually find the solution to the differential equation, we integrated both sides. So there was also an integral involving G of T. Okay, but as long as those are continuous, you can take those integrals, and then we really can just directly construct any solutions to any initial value problem. Uh, and to check that it's unique, it's not too difficult either. More or less, just all the steps that we did in, in, in that method were kind of reversible. Multiplying by this mu of t function is, actu is actually a reversible step because it's never zero. It had the form uh, mu of t is equal to uh, an exponential times an integral of p of t dt. And so you can see this function, because it's given by an exponential like this, it'll never be 0. So if you multiply the whole function by mu of t, you can reverse that process by dividing the whole function by mu of t. And that's no problem. OK. So that's this theorem. Um, there's a very similar uh, theorem for second order linear ODEs, which we will be using in the future. So it looks basically exactly the same. Uh, the only difference, right, is now in a second order linear equation, we have three coefficient functions because we've gone up to y double prime. So now we have a p of t, a q of t, as well as a g of t. So we'll need all of those to be continuous. And also we have a second initial condition, uh, a condition on y prime. From a physical standpoint, if you think about this, this kind of makes sense. A second order equation, those come up quite a lot in classical mechanics, where uh, the second derivative of a position function with respect to time is the acceleration. And uh, Newton's laws tell you that force is equal to mass times acceleration, and that will give rise to all kinds of second order differential equations like this. And so you, don't, you need not only the initial position, but you also need the initial velocity to figure out where an object's going to go under a bunch of forces, right? Um, if you have something falling under the influence of gravity or something like this, you know, if it starts out going really fast, that's going to have a totally different trajectory than something that starts out at rest. Okay, uh, the proof of this, we are not going to be able to just directly construct solutions to these, though. Even though the theorem looks very similar, you can't just prove it by saying, ah, we know how to solve all of these. This is not the case. Even in this linear case for second orders, it's pretty much hopeless in general. So once you've gone up to second order, it gets quite a lot harder. Uh, 
we will solve some of them, but only in very special cases. And um, we will get some sort of general properties about second order linear differential equations, like things you can do with solutions to get other solutions, but not quite uh, just solving any one of any of them you want in terms of integrals like liquid in the first order case. But the theorem looks the same, right? We have uh, this open interval from alpha to beta in the hypotheses where you know the coefficient functions are continuous is the same interval where you know your solution to initial value problems will be defined. So that's quite nice. All right, and the last theorem we'll talk about is the nonlinear first order case. So this one it looks a bit different, has different hypotheses as well as a different conclusion. So now we're in the general case, so we can't just, we don't just have coefficient functions of t, we instead have this general situation where y prime is written as a function that can depend on both t as well as y. And so now, um, continuity of this two variable function f is not enough to get unique solutions. You also, it turns out, need continuity of the y partial derivative. So this f of ty is a two variable function, so taking this y partial derivative makes sense. And so now, rather than looking at an interval, we're in two dimensional space, so we look at this rectangle. Uh, again, it's an open, so it'll be some kind of open rectangle where t goes between alpha and beta and y is going between gamma and delta. All right. So on, in that situation, we do end up getting unique solutions, but the conclusion's not, as, not quite as good as in the linear case. We end up with what might be a smaller interval. So you see here, this t0 minus h, t0 plus h, this is just some sort of arbitrary open interval containing t0. It might be very, very small. It does not have to be the full open interval from alpha to beta like it was in the linear case. All right, uh, there is an interesting situation. If you know that f is continuous, but the y partial derivative is not, then it turns out you do still get existence of solutions, but you might not have uniqueness. Okay, we're also not gonna prove this one. Uh, it's pretty difficult. Um, yeah, these are just review lectures, so I probably, I'm not gonna go into any details at all. In a, in a full differential equations class, at this level, I would probably give some ideas of the proof, but here, not really. So the main tool is something called the contraction mapping theorem that you could encounter if you took some kind of uh, real analysis, undergraduate real analysis course. Um, but yeah, you, you, you rewrite it in terms of integrals and do something with iteration. That's about all I'll say. The proof's kind of difficult. All right, so now let's look at some examples to see how these theorems play out in practice. Okay, the first example is one that we've already done. This is the, this is a uh, first order linear differential equation that we did at the end of the first lecture. And we ended up with this solution, y is equal to t squared plus one over t squared. And we saw that for this initial value problem with the initial condition y of one equals two, the solution is defined for positive t values. Right, we know we have some discontinuity at t equals zero for this one over t squared part of the function. And because we need to include the initial condition t equals one, uh, the biggest connected interval we'll get that, that can, contains the initial t value will be the interval t is greater than zero. Okay, but if we look, at the, look back at the first order linear existence and uniqueness theorem, we could see that we were guaranteed to have a unique solution that was defined on this interval without going through the process of solving it. And that's because we just have to look at uh, where the coefficient functions are continuous. And we see here that the g of t function is 4t, the p of t function is this coefficient, which is 2 over t, and 4t is continuous everywhere, 2 over t is continuous everywhere except t equals zero. And so the like alpha beta interval we could take back in the first order linear existence uniqueness theorem, this interval, we could take it as alpha equals zero, beta is equal to infinity. So we could get that open interval where both p of t and g of t are continuous. And then the theorem says we're guaranteed a unique solution that will be defined on that full interval, t is positive, which is what we ended up getting when we solved it in practice. 
Okay, next we will look at a nonlinear example. Uh, here, here we're using x as the independent variable instead of t. It doesn't really make a difference. Right? Obviously, you can change the variable names to be whatever you want. Um, all right. So this one is definitely nonlinear. So we need to use the general theorem. You know, this, it's already in that standard form. So this uh, lowercase f of x, y function is just the right-hand side of the equation. All right, and now if we want to look at where this thing is continuous, uh, it's just a rational function, so we just need to look at where the denominator is 0, and we can factor that like so. Right, it's y times the quantity y squared minus 4, and that factors as one, y plus 2 times y minus 2. All right, so the zeros are at y equals 0 and plus or minus 2, so that's where that will fail to be continuous. And if we take the y partial derivative of this f of x, y function, that'll, that ends up having essentially the same denominator, right? It's just the denominator quantity squared, so that will have the same zeros. So this also is continuous except at 0 and plus or minus 2. Right. This is using the uh, single variable calculus quotient rule. The derivative of the bottom is just this 3y squared minus 4 term. So a minus sign times that times the numerator and then divide by the denominator squared. All right. So those are the only discontinuities for both those functions. So in any case, we are guaranteed a, a, that a unique solution to this initial value problem exists. This initial condition does not involve y equals 0 or plus or minus 2, right? We're only looking at y equals 1. So we are guaranteed that there will be some uh, unique solution that exists. And if we and at this rectangle back in the hypotheses of the theorem, right, we have limits for this uh, gamma and delta, right? These, I guess, we'd have to take as 0 and positive 2. But there's no limits on t, right? Alpha and beta could be minus infinity and infinity. Right? We only encounter discontinuities in these functions uh, in the y direction. So we could make this rectangle go infinitely far in the x direction, but it turns out that is not enough to get that the solution is defined on all, on all of R. And I mean, we were clued into this in the statement of the theorem, right? We end up with a possibly smaller interval. So no matter how big the interval alpha to beta is in the hypotheses, you might end up with something very small in the conclusion. OK. So let's see what happens when we actually solve it. So here, this one, it's nonlinear, but it is separable, right? The numerator isn't just stuff involving x. The denominator is just stuff involving y. So if we multiply both sides by the denominator, then we will be separating the variables. We can integrate both sides. And then we're just integrating polynomials, so it's no big deal. So we end up with y to the fourth over 4 minus 2y squared is equal to x squared over 2 plus x cubed plus c. All right, and that's about as far as we can go. Uh, actually, explicitly solving for y in this case is uh, maybe you could do it, but it would be some super annoying algebra and uh, involving lots of square roots and stuff that I'm definitely not going to bother doing. All right. Uh, in any case, if we want to solve this initial value problem, even if we haven't solved explicitly for y, we can still just plug in the initial conditions. So we have x equals 0 and y is equal to 1. On the left-hand side, this term gives us a 1 fourth. This becomes a 2. These x terms just go to 0, so we'll end up with 1 fourth minus 2 is equal to c, or in other words, c is equal to minus 7 fourths, and we can plug that back into the earlier expression in order to get this solution to the initial value problem. Well, all right, this is some kind of implicit curve involving x and y, but at least the unique solution to the initial value problem will be some portion of this curve. OK, and since we haven't solved explicitly y as a function of x. I said earlier that this isn't going to be defined on all of r, but 
just looking at it like this, it's sort of unclear where this function is actually defined. So to see what's going on, we should look at the graph. OK, and so here's a graph of this implicit curve. And we can see, yeah, there are definitely some issues going on at y is equal to 0 and plus or minus 2. So that's not so surprising, right? These were the points where uh, the denominator of f of x, y was equal to 0. And so, yeah, these will be the only points where you're not going to be able to find uh, a unique solution. Right, these are the points where the theorem will actually fail. For the initial value problem, we're looking at this y of 0 is equal to 1 situation. There is a unique solution, it just might not be defined everywhere. And indeed, that's the case, right? We cannot go infinitely far starting at x equals 0 in both directions, right? Going in the positive direction, we run up into this point and can go no further in the positive x direction, right? If we start looping back around the other direction, now it's it's no longer a function, right? You're, you'd have like two different y values for a given x value, so that's no good. And similarly, if you try to go in this direction, you can't go any farther without sort of looping back around and failing to be a function. Okay, so those are the points where our solution to the initial value problem will end up being defined. Uh, yeah, so this would be the graph zoomed in and only looking at this portion between y equals 0 and y equals 2. So we see we are satisfying this initial condition that y of 0 is equal to 1. At least this portion of that implicit curve is a, is a well-behaved function. y is a function of x. And uh, yeah, so again, the, the conclusion we're reaching is that even though the rectangle we could make in the hypotheses of the existence and uniqueness theorem went infinitely far in the x direction, in both the positive and negative x directions, we still only ended up with this solution that uh, was defined on a finite interval. So it looks like, um, yeah, I think this point is exactly x equals minus a half. Sorry, minus one and a half, I mean. Minus three halves, I should say. All right, sorry, I got it. Yeah. The numbers got a little bit cut off at the bottom here, sorry. Uh, and this one is something, you know, slightly bigger than one. So, approximately one, but it's a little bigger. All right. OK, so we did run into some issues as far as uh, getting an interval of existence going on as, as long as we liked. But the problems we ran into were these values at y equals 0 and y equals 2, which we could recognize from the original equation. Right? Those were definitely issues for the denominator of the right-hand side of this differential equation. Uh, it turns out, actually, that's not always going to be the case. You may, you may run into problems, discontinuities in your solution, that there's no way that you can detect from the original differential equation. You really just have to go through and solve it to see where they are in the nonlinear case. Um, all right, so we'll see that in this next example. So here we have y prime is equal to y squared. OK, and yeah, it's the same initial condition, y of 0 equals 1. So once again, we got to use the general theorem. But in this case, there are no discontinuities in f or in its y partial derivative, right? f is just y squared. df dy is just 2y. Those are continuous everywhere. So we do know that every initial value problem has a unique solution defined somewhere. And from the previous example, we ran into some problems where discontinuities in f and df dy showed up. So we might think, well, we're good. The solutions, we can solve every initial value problem. They should all be defined everywhere. But uh, no, the theorem does not tell us that. The, we don't get any information about the interval where the solution is defined from this uh, general existence and uniqueness theorem. This h, this h here could just be really small. This interval around t0, it can be very, very small. And there's no way to tell what it is from the 
the original differential equation without solving it. OK, well, let's, let's solve it and see what happens. So again, this one's separable. In fact, it doesn't even depend on t at all. It only depends on y. So there's not really any variables to separate. But we do need to move the y squared onto the left-hand side so we can you know, do this chain rule step here from separation of variables. Um, all right, so the left-hand side, we're integrating 1 over y squared, or the integral of y to the negative 2. That's minus 1 over y. The right-hand side, we're just integrating 1, so we get t plus c. And so we end up with y is equal to minus 1 over t plus c. All right, so yeah, that was not a particularly challenging differential equation to solve. Uh, now, to solve the initial value problem, we just plug in t equals 0 and y equals 1. So if we do that, we're going to get 1 is equal to minus 1 over 0 plus c. All right, so that tells us that c is equal to minus 1. And so we have the solution y is equal to minus 1 over t minus 1, but we can rewrite that as y equals 1 over 1 minus t. All right, so that's the solution to the initial value problem. And indeed, that uh, definitely has a discontinuity at t equals 1. So this one's not going to be defined everywhere. Yep, so this one is only defined on the interval from minus infinity to 1, right? We need to be sure we're choosing the interval that, ac that actually contains our initial t value, t equals 0. So that's our interval of existence for the solution to this initial value problem. But yeah, the t equals 1, there was no way to tell what was that, that that was going to be some discontinuity in our solution just by looking at the original equation or looking at the initial value. Right, like y equals 1 was, some, was an initial value, but there was nothing about t. It was not, nothing about t equals 1. We had t equals 0 was the initial t condition. t didn't appear at all in the original differential equation. Uh, f and df dy were both continuous everywhere. There was no reason to expect that t equals 1 would be a problem. But it is in this case. That is a, uh, a discontinuity for this solution to the initial value problem. Uh, and in fact, it's going to change, right? The, the point where you run into a discontinuity for your solution will change depending on the initial condition, right? If you look back at... Uh, before we plugged in our initial conditions, we were looking at this uh, expression for y, telling us a bunch of different solutions. And we see that uh, when t is equal to negative c, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, run into a discontinuity. And so that's going to change when you change the initial condition, right? Because the solutions are all, because the solutions are unique, right? For different initial conditions, you're going to get different c values. Uh, and so you will run into different points of discontinuity in all of those solutions. So this was not the case for the, the linear, for the case of linear uh, first order equations, right? Here, discontinuity, you may have discontinuities for your solutions to initial value problems, but they only depend on where you run into discontinuities of P of T and G of T. They don't depend on the initial conditions at all. It's just going to be things depending on where p of t and g of t have discontinuities. So in this case, uh, yeah, in the general nonlinear case, you may well have discontinuities in your solutions changing when you change the initial conditions. And another interesting thing that happens here is that this expression y equals minus 1 over t plus c doesn't actually give you all of the solutions to this differential equation. We're missing one, uh, namely the function that y is equal to 0 for all t is also a solution, right? If y, uh, y is 0 for all t, then y prime is also 0 for all t. And then in the differential equation, we'd have 0 is equal to 0, so that one's definitely a solution. And yeah, that was not present in, our, uh, in this expression we gave here. So, the method of integrating factors will always give you all of the solutions. So it does make sense to talk about a general solution in that case. Um, but separation of variables, it's actually not the case that you will necessarily get all of the solutions when you do it. You might, you might miss some, as in the case here. OK. Um, 
Now our last example, remember there was this line at the end of the general existence and uniqueness theorem where if the partial derivative is not continuous, then solutions might not be unique. So our last example will show that situation. Okay, so here we will start with this initial value problem. Y prime is Y to the one third with the initial condition Y of zero equals zero. And so, yes, we have exactly the situation I was saying. Y to the one third is continuous everywhere, but its derivative, which is one third Y to the minus two thirds, has Y in the denominator. So that has a discontinuity at Y equals zero. Y equals zero is involved in our initial condition. So we might not have a unique solution. Okay, let's see what happens if we try to solve it. So again, this one just depends on y, so we just need to uh, divide both sides by y to the one-third, integrate both sides. And so here, integrating y to the minus one-third, we will end up with three halves y to the two-thirds. And the right-hand side, we, we get t plus c again. Okay, and here... If we plug in the initial conditions, we'll just get c equals 0. Right, we'd be plugging in 0 here and 0 here. So we just get c equals 0. All right, so we have this expression, 3 halves y to the 2 thirds is equal to t. But now, if we want to actually solve explicitly for y, we'll be doing a 3 halves power, but that's the same as taking a square root and then cubing it, or cubing it and then taking a square root, either order. In any case, we're doing a square root, so we have to make sure we do a negative square root as well. All right, so that's where this plus or minus comes, comes from. And indeed, we found at least two solutions. Y is plus or minus 2 thirds t to the 3 halves to this initial value problem. All right, well, there's a small caveat on that that, we'll, that I'll discuss in a second. But uh, also, there's another solution we missed, which is just like in the previous one, y, if y of t is 0 for all t, we'll solve the initial value problem again, right? Once again, y prime is also equal to 0, so that will, solve, that will be a solution to this differential equation. All right, but... It's actually... It's not just three solutions that we run into. It's... Uh, Uniqueness fails to an even greater degree, which is that there will actually be infinitely many solutions to this initial value problem. We'll have a full infinite family of solutions that will show up here. Um, the reason for this is that this thing, this uh, y is equal to plus or minus two thirds t to the three halves, that doesn't actually give us a full solution because we're taking a square root which means we're not allowed to do this for negative values of t. So this thing, this only is defined for t greater than or equal to zero. So that's not actually a full, that won't actually give us like a full solution to this initial value problem, right? We need to, we're starting at t equals zero. And so to have a, to have a solution, we're supposed to have something where we can go in both directions, right? That's back at the in this existence and uniqueness theorem, right? We're supposed to be able to go slightly to the left of t0 and slightly to the right of t0, right? We have some interval t0 minus h to t0 plus h. And in this case, we can only go in the positive direction. So we're missing part of the solution, but it turns out what we're missing is just this function. So because this function, this first, this thing here, either the positive or this negative square root, uh, satisfies y prime of 0 equals 0, we can stitch it together with this function that's just 0 for all values of t. So we can end up with something that's, you know, 0 will be 0 until t equals 0. And then at that point, we'll go off 
and, and curve upwards or downwards. So that would be in this picture here. We would start t equals zero. I guess I didn't draw, I didn't have the left part of the graph showing. We go, it would just be equal to zero for the negative part of the graph, but then at t equals zero, we could curve up like this following the arrows, or we could curve down following these arrows instead, and those would give us two solutions. But in fact, we could just do that whenever we want, at any value, at any arbitrary t0 value. Right, so here this t0 is arbitrary. We could decide to make this switch where we stop going, where we're identically equal to zero for everything to the left of t0, and then we go along one of these curves, either up or down, at that point. And that's because you know, and uh, any of these expressions like this will also be solutions to a differential equation. Before we plugged in for t equals, uh, we plugged in c equals zero right here, we would be in this situation, right? So y is two thirds t plus c, and then we'd be plus or minus to the three halves. So anything like that is a solution. And then here we're just taking c is equal to minus t0 to come up with these functions here. OK, so those are these, these, those are these other curves that are shown on the graph here. So at any point, we can start curving upwards or curving downwards. And that would give us a new solution. And all of these solve the initial value problem, right? Because they all pass through this point. You're just a horizontal line passing through that point, And then at some positive t value, you'll curve up or down but you'll definitely still solve this initial value problem where y of zero is equal to zero. Oh yeah, so yeah, we can, because the, the value of the function and the first derivative agree, we can stitch these functions together to make some sort of, we can, to make a piecewise function like this that solves the differential equation. Uh, there, there will be problems in the second derivative for sure, but in terms of this differential equation, we only care about the first derivative, so uh, it's enough for the, as long as the, the function itself and its first derivative don't have any issues, it's, that's fine as a solution to this differential equation. Uh, in any case, right, the second derivative, we're going to have problems anyway, because if we take the derivative of this uh, right-hand side, you know that we're going to run into some issues of like y to the minus two-thirds, like we had on this preview slide. So there will be issues with the second derivative probably no matter what except for this one the, if you have just y of t is equal to zero for all values of t of course the second derivative there will be fine okay anyway yes so here uniqueness has failed to a very extreme degree we have an, we have infinitely many uh infinitely many solutions that solve this initial value problem all right so let's just summarize what we came up with here okay so first order linear differential equations as I said, the theorem there was quite nice. So we do get a general solution. So the method of integrating factors does actually give us a sort of nice form of the solution we, we can write down involving some arbitrary constant of c, which gives us all of the solutions to that differential equation. They can be solved directly in terms of integrals using this method of integrating factors. And the discontinuities of the solution can be detected by finding discontinuities of the coefficient functions p of t and g of t. So you can find discont discontinuities in your solution just by examining the original differential equation. And so, yes, all of these things are going to be false for general nonlinear first order differential equations. Uh, so yeah, we definitely ran into problems for the first statement and the third statement in our examples. But as far as the like not being able to solve them directly, uh, the only not nonlinear ones we know how to solve are separable ones. If it's not separable, we've got no clue. So yeah, it, do it does turn out that uh, there are quite a lot of first order differential equations that you cannot solve by hand, even in terms of integrals. And for second order and higher, it's even more hopeless. All right, so I think that's where I will stop for today. Uh, so here are some links to some quantum formalism stuff, or if you want to find earlier lectures, there's the YouTube channel there. And on the next lecture, we will start talking about second order differential equations.